Rebel News covered the Reclaim Canada conference put on by We Unity. You can check out more of that on our site. We have multiple reports that you're really going to enjoy if you're concerned about freedoms in Canada. But today is a report, a treat for you. It's an interview with the Honorable Brian Peckford, former Premier of Newfoundland and the only living First Minister left who was part of shaping our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I'm Drea Humphrey, and this is the Honorable Brian Peckford. All right. And as part of the Reclaim Canada conference put on by We Unify, keynote speaker here, former premier for Newfoundland and one of the only or the only living premier or former premier to be involved with our Canadian Charter for Freedom and Rights. So thanks so much for being back on Rebel News. Thank you very much for having me. I'm the only living first minister. When you say first minister, that means prime minister or premier. That's the difference in saying premier or prime minister. When you say first minister, you're including the prime minister and the premiers. See, getting educated from the right person to do it. And make sure you check out our interview with Ezra Levant and yourself, because that explains a lot about, um, you know, why you did that. But can you take us sort of to the headspace you were in when that was happening, that moment back in the 80s where you were changing or being part of changing our constitution? What did that feel like? Well, it was a very uh, pr pressure situation because we had a lot of uh, people from across Canada, especially a lot of organizations, well-organized organizations, who were interested in seeing change, who were interested in seeing the, uh, our individual rights and freedoms put in the Constitution. Uh, the only thing close to that was the Bill of Rights in 1960, which was a federal act of Parliament. It wasn't a constitutional measure, so it didn't apply to all Canadians, only applied to some Canadians. That's why the charter was necessary. So it was a very pressurized situation, and it went on for 17 months, the negotiations for the charter and the other elements in the Constitution Act of 1982. It wasn't just a charter, or many other things involved. So the charter was part of the bargaining that was going on with the other elements, like minority language rights, like indigenous rights, like equalization, they were all part of that package, including the charter. So because it was not just a charter and a lot of other things involved, of course, minority language rights, there were a lot of people very interested in that. The First Nations were all very interested in whether they were going to get some protection under the Constitution directly and not just through treaty and other arrangements that they had with the Crown. So all of these things conspired to, to cause uh, a very what shall I say, pressurized situation over a long period of time. And it got more pressurized when the Prime Minister at the time, Justin Trudeau's father, uh, decided that he was going to try to unilaterally do it. And so he left the table and had to come back later when he lost in court. And so when you add all of that up together, it was an extremely pressurized situation. It would be the first time having a major uh, Constitution Act outside of the first one in 1867. So yeah, it was an extremely... Uh, heady time, but we all knew at the time that what we were doing was very historic and uh, very necessary if we could bring it off. And so I think that's perhaps the best way to describe it. And Canada has been the land of the free. Many have come here to be free, uh, partly because of our constitution. And now we're in another historical moment since 2020 when COVID-19 came. And I know you've spoken out many times about the concerns you have with the infringements on those rights yeah. that are in the charter. So take us into the headspace you felt. Take us back to the moment, whether that was 2020 or 2021, where you went, wait a minute, yeah. this is contrary to everything that I worked for in that moment before. Yeah, like most other Canadians, first of all, you, you, you tend to, in the first instance, especially having been a first minister yourself, to trust what people were saying to you, right? You know, the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, the various departments of health in all the provinces and their public health officers. And so your first inclination, especially as a Canadian, how nice we all are, as you hear in this conference, uh, you, you give the first uh, thing to the, to the government and say they're doing the right thing. But very early on, it became very clear to me when uh, I realized that this new vaccine that they were starting to push for to, to combat this alleged pandemic and this alleged problem was not being uh, protected or the people who were manufacturing this uh, virus 
we're not going to be legally responsible if anything happened negative about the virus. In other words, I could go buy a car and get a warranty on a, on a car, but I had no warranty on something that I was going to put in my body which could affect my health. And that, that sounds really odd to me to have a medical procedure which had no ramifications for the people who were making money off of that medical procedure. So that was perhaps uh, issue number one. Then I began to hear rumblings about Dr. Hoff in, in Lytton, B.C., here where I live, and how he was being treated by the authorities. And, of course, that was a real red flag, and I called him and w when I found out the facts of the matter, that, yes, he was being harassed just because he expressed some vaccine hesitancy, as if that was a criminal, uh, something in the criminal code then uh, that was enough for me. And so uh, I began to speak out um, on my blog and, and speak out wherever anybody would listen to me. And that became more intense as time went on and the more and more mandates came in, which clearly violated sections 2, 6, 7, 15 of our charter, right? The freedoms of expression, you know, life, liberty, security of the person, security of the person. I mean, amazing. Section 7 of our charter, security, as you heard doctors at this conference talk about it, and, and a very a very seasoned constitutional lawyer talk about security to person means autonomy over your own body. And so it was obvious to anybody who had studied or been involved in the charter and somebody who had helped write it, like me, that a massive violation was going on here and it was time to speak up. And for those of you who didn't catch the story, uh, BC High School had the honor of you coming to speak to the children about our rights and freedoms, and that was canceled. Can you tell us what on earth happened there? Yeah, this is a very sad story because it was a teacher at that school who actually approached me, approached my wife and I, if, if I would find the time to speak to the students there about the charter because they heard I was doing that on Zoom to a lot of communities, and I was doing it live to a lot of other communities on Vancouver Island. Here we were, right in my own little city of Parksville. Uh, this high school teacher said, well, why, why shouldn't we get them to speak to the students here who are doing the um, subject matter along the lines of, you know, legalism and, and constitutionalism and so on, and given that what was going on all around us about this. And so the, she called us, and we said yes. And then we got a date, and we said to her early on, you know, are you sure this is going to work? Because we know of other examples where people thought it was only automatic that if they were going to invite the only living father, right, who helped create the Constitution and the Charter, uh, that it would just be automatic. But she did go then and check with the principal of the school and got a full approval to move ahead. Then we set up the date. And about 36 hours, 48 hours before the event, that the teacher was planning, all the teachers and parents were very excited. Uh, she was calling the principal's office one afternoon, just a day and a half before we were supposed to, I was supposed to turn up there, and was told that this was canceled. And when she asked why it was canceled, the uh, answer coming back was, well, you know, Mr. Pecker is a very controversial figure. One, two, that perhaps somebody in the audience might ask the wrong question, and Mr. Peckford might give a wrong comment. And so they had already decided, right, they had anticipated that uh, I was going to say something that was out of line with their thinking and that they had already decided that I, I could say something wrong, however they defined wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, or a student could say something wrong, however they defined wrong coming out of the student. So obviously they had bought into the government narrative and obviously uh, a direction came down from somewhere, uh, quite like, because the principal had already approved it. So one can only uh, conclude from that mm -hmm that either the principal had a chain of heart herself or himself, I think it was a female, or the school board heard about it and got on to the principal and order stopped. In either way, the, the thing got stopped, and I was unable to speak to students in the high school in my own town. What a shame and very concerning when we think of restraints from cancel culture being put on uh, the young, our future here in Canada. In closing, I want to ask you about a lawsuit. Uh, give some hope at the end of this interview. Yes. Um, tell us about the lawsuit you're working on, what it's focused on, yes. and, and within that, um, why it's important to have the charter be essential to that versus some people who say you should go with the Bill of Rights. Right. Well, largely, to answer the, your last question first, the Bill of Rights uh, 
doesn't apply in this case because I'm not involved with the federal government, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's the Charter of Rights where it talks about travel, right? Section 6 is mobility, right? And the right of every citizen to move anywhere in Canada or leave Canada. And so I launched this lawsuit because in all the speeches I was making, I was talking the talk. And one morning I woke up and I said, you know, any day now, somebody's going to say to me at one of these meetings, Mr. Peckford, you know, thanks for explaining uh, what happened and how these charter rights came about and how it became part of the Constitution and your knowledge of it. And we really appreciate all that. But at the end of the day, uh, what do you, you know, what's, what's going to happen? And what are you else doing about it, right, besides talking about it? And so I thought I should start walking the walk as well as, well as talking the talk. And the reason why I chose the travel ban of the federal government is because two reasons. Historically, travel and transportation made Canada, right? The railway going west created the opportunity to form, to create the province of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia. Over half the geography of the country, right, was for, it got formed quicker and more substantively because of travel. The early explorers and our First Nations lived off the rivers of Canada, the St. Lawrence itself, right? The Fraser River, the Skeena River. You can go all around Canada and find hundreds of rivers that the First Nations were involved in. So, so transportation is very critical to the second largest country in the world, geographically. Two, um, I could go reference, because it was a federal mandate, I could go straight to the Federal Court of Canada, and then the next step is the Supreme Court of Canada. And so right now, the, courses, the court action is underway. I filed a lawsuit early this year. Uh, our, my lawyers, through the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms, and Mr. Keith Wilson, who's been hired as an outside lawyer, who's got experience in these matters, is the lead lawyer. And so they're working through the case management of this court case. It's ongoing as we speak. And the actual public part of the hearing will be in September. Dates are set, five days in September it will be heard. And then the judge goes away and makes a decision. It is my hope that the judge can make a decision after that December hearing before Christmas. So we would have a decision. And perhaps it may be one of the first decisions uh, of, the, of its kind in Canada. Many other people, by the way, have joined in with me on this so that we don't have five or six of the same lawsuits going to the federal court because that would only aggravate the federal court, right? It wouldn't, wouldn't be helpful. And so they have agreed, other people across Canada who are going to take this kind of travel mandate suit out, have joined in with us their lawyers have and everybody. So this case is not only a case now launched by me, uh, but by M Maxim Bernier as head of the People's Party of Canada is involved and five other individuals all named and have all filed um, affidavits. So this case does represent a very good argument from a lot of people of how they've been hurt by the travel mandate and then goes to the heart of the charter. Section 6, right? Travel. We have the right as individual Canadians to travel anywhere we want in Canada. And of course, it also violates life liberty, right? Yeah, my life, my, my liberty. It violates a citizen's liberty. And so this is a very important case. And uh, let's hope that uh, the lawyers and our arguments, we think, will be sufficient. Uh, and that time has gone along so that a lot of these judges who were just looking at the science of the government is now looking at the science of the science, right. scientists, so that they have a broader perspective by the time we get there in September to look at this and say, holy smoke, there was science around two years ago, but we didn't look at it because we were told here was the real science that the government had given us. Hopefully there's some judges around, independent, who will look at this in its totality, as they've done in New Zealand and their court in New Zealand, as they've done in a court in India, as they've done in a court in Portugal, and said, this violates the rights of citizens, and you have not proven or justified that you, what you've done was necessary. 
So let's hope for a big Christmas present. <laughs> Absolutely. And where's the best place for people to find more information uh, about the case? Go to the Federal Court of Canada or to the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms and you'll find out about the case. And then I think it's going to be done mainly electronically. And so there will be uh, access to that hearing in September. All right, there you have it. The Honorable Brian Peckford. And unlike those students who were robbed uh, to hear from your wisdom, you got to hear from him on Rebel News. Drea Humphrey for Rebel News. Well, I'll definitely have my boots on the ground to make sure you guys are informed on what happens in that important case. And in case you're unaware, we have a special website called fightvaccinepassports.com. That's because the Democracy Fund has taken on many freedom-related cases, including the one I recently covered, a challenge to vaccine passports in British Columbia that we are still waiting for the Honorable Chief Justice Hinkson's ruling on. But without your help and your donations to help cover the cost of these cases, we cannot fight for a new precedent of freedom in Canada. So if you want to be part of the action to restore freedom, Freedom in Canada, please donate what you can at fightvaccinepassports.com.